this process of successful modernization and reform and emulation, this is a process that continues in the Muslim world and has so far been largely unsuccessful, but the challenge remains. Faced in a society whose traditional idea of culture, whose traditional idea of uh, identity is closely tied up to religious notions, it's clear that the, the, the engagement with religion is going to now play a strong role in these various attempts to come to grips with modernity. And there have been, roughly speaking, four broad approaches in the Muslim world to deal with the challenge of modernity in ideational terms. And remember that these four approaches that I'm going to lay out in, in a few seconds are ideal types in the Weberian sense. So you will find that they're, they're deliberately purified concepts. So we, we, and for analytical reasons, we focus on certain aspects of them. So in reality, you will find elements of all four approaches in the various countries you will see. But try to keep them for a moment analytically separate, so just to make clear what the difference between them are. And the first approach is the complete emulation of the West, which then comes with it comes a, a strong tendency towards secularism. And similar to the Japanese tradition, or the Japanese reaction to the foreign intervention, you now have in the 19th century in Muslim countries, particularly in Turkey and in Iran, but also elsewhere, intellectuals and government officials who now argue that we need to copy what the West has done and what is the source of the West's power and strength. So you now see, as in this photo here, the development of modern institutions dedicated to, in this case, this is the University of Cairo, so you have now new universities being founded, not in the tradition of Muslim learning, but modeled on Western science-oriented, rational uh, learning. You have, as in this photo, which shows the Ottoman Ministry of Defense, there is now the, uh, both in architecture and in organizational structures, the attempt to copy what has made the West powerful. The second group is religious modernism. These are people who are a little bit like, like uh, Allah Ahmad, who was one of the forefathers of other religious modernists, who say, no, we need to stay close to our, to our traditions, which are religion, so we cannot cast away aside Islam but we need to reform it. And the countries most closely associated with this approach are probably Morocco and Tunisia nowadays. Empirically, this has been the most dominant response in the Muslim world. Obviously, life has changed. That was clear, it was a simple empirical observation. And as you see here, modernity had arrived. You have now modern forms of transport, modern ways of production. So there's this understanding that our norms and customs must change as well. But the reforms that are deemed necessary are painstakingly defended in Islamic terms, particularly in terms of Islamic law. And the prime example of this approach towards change that is deemed necessary for practical reasons, but defended on Islamic religious grounds, is perhaps the 1958 uh, Tunisian family law. And you see the same approach in the Moroccan, um, or that were not, uh, in the, of, the, of roughly the same period, 1957-58, and even more dramatic in the 2004 overhaul of the, the Moroccan family law. And in both cases, you have the, the approach is that, yes, we need to change our customs, we need to change the way we regulate things, particularly the role of women in, in, in a modern economy. But we do this on the basis of existing religiously defined norms. So there is dramatic change in objective terms, but the change is defended religiously. The third basic approach to modernity 
has been the traditionalists, perhaps best symbolized by Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf monarchies. And their approach has been that there is actually no need to change, that Islamic governance and Islamic societies are not just okay, but they're actually superior to the decadent ways of the West. And they say, seem to, to focus on the negative aspects of modern life. One of the things, for example, that I often highlight is the, the high divorce rates, the, 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 the negative impact on family life, prostitution, etc. And it says our societies are actually much more stable. They're based on Islam, and there's a particular notion of Islamic law as being already all-encompassing and sufficient to regulate all aspects of life, traditional or modern. And therefore, there is this, this, this belief that we actually don't need to change. It's important now to re realize that these societies are not averse to the technical innovations that modernity brings. So as you can, anybody who visits the the Gulf countries, you will readily see that they're very open towards technology, um, particularly as you know, consumer goods that are produced in the West, and also they import people who operate these elements of modernity for them. But their own societies, they think they can keep separate from the insidious impacts of modernity. So these are the traditionalists, the conservationists. And the fourth and perhaps most important group, and most important in terms of the, the space they occupy on the political agenda and on the minds, the imagination of both Muslims and non-Muslims alike, are what I now loosely refer to as the fundamentalists. And this is a very active, very diverse group of people, theoretically very productive, who do accept that modernity is posing a challenge. Fundamentalists reacting to the failure of both secularists and religious modernists to come up with a workable theory of government in, in, in the modern world are now positing the, the confrontation with the West in terms of an irreconcilable difference. They present Islam as inherently superior to both capitalist and socialist approaches from the West. And they look at the, the, the practical failures of, of Arab government or Muslim government that has been based on the emulation of Western models. And they say, we need to go back to the sources. And that's where the word fundamentalism comes from. So we need to go back to the foundations and recreate Islam as it was envisaged by the, the Prophet. And they posit Islam as the only moral order with themselves as the exclusive interpretations, inter, interpreters of the divine will and see in Khomeini's famous words Islam as a third way, as the, the superior way of, of arranging their societies. And this school of thought in the wake of the 1967 defeat by Israel has grown in dramatically in importance and in the capture of the, the popular mind, both in the West, uh, in the Muslim world and outside. So to briefly recap, recap, recapitulate, there are four approaches. So you have the emulators, the secularists, first group. The second group are the religious modernists. The third group are the tr traditionalists who try to conserve Islamic society as it is. And the first group, the fundamentalists who want to dramatically and radically change Muslim societies. And one of the key points of contention between them is the role of Islamic law in the public realm. And overall, try to keep these four groups in mind because we will structure the outline of the course as it, as it follows, according to the, the groupings of the countries into these respective four groups.